don't waste your time on low priority things. Only go after things that are truly, deeply meaningful and inspiring to you. So you will walk your talk and achieve things and build momentum. I have been involved in, in uh, I guess you could say, the pursuit of self-mastery since I was 18. And I'm 68, just in a few weeks. And so I've been doing it a bit, 50 years. And there are certain principles, certain actions that I feel very confidently um, in saying will help you do something extraordinary with your life, help you master your life. I don't know about you, but I'm assuming you would love to master your life. I, I certainly wanted to do mine. I wanted to empower all of the seven areas of my life. My spiritual quest, my mind development, my career, my wealth, my, my family dynamics, social leadership, physical fitness, everything. So whatever your goals are, whatever your intentions are, based on what you value, one thing and for the last 45 years that I learned is you want to start with something that you're certain about when you're shooting for goals and objectives to achieve something in life. You don't want to just go after you. Sometimes we go and we compare ourselves to other people. We meet somebody and we go, wow, they're amazing. They've done something amazing. And they go, oh, I would like to do that. And we get kind of distracted and scattered. I just had a client yesterday who said that they went off on another wild goose chase and they constantly go off in these wild goose chases. And we traced it down to the moment they see something, read something or meet somebody that they look up to, and then they tend to infiltrate some of the values of those people, and they tend to sidetrack, trying to be somebody they're not, and they keep defaulting back to who they are. And a lot of times you think that there's something wrong with you. You think that there's a weakness or there's a, you know, a sabotage or a limiting belief or whatever, but really what those are are just distractions from what's really important to you, and you have to go learn to not put people on pedestals. And um, that's the lesson, you know, you're not, instead of putting them on a pedestal and minimizing yourself, so why don't you go find out what you see in them, find out where you have that same ability and trait already demonstrated in your values and stay focused. But the first principle that I want you to write down is it is really wise to determine what you really value, what's really your life is demonstrating you're committed to. Now, if I look at my life over the last 50 years, it's not hard to see that I've been consistently, spontaneously doing something. And that is learning everything I can get my hands on and sharing it with everybody I get my, my outreach to. And that's something that I've been doing since I was 18 years old. So if I look at what my life demonstrates as what's really important to me, it shows up. And I've been, for the last 45 years, helping people determine what they value and I slowly but surely developed a methodology to assist people in doing that. And I, you know I've mentioned it in some of my presentations, and it's the Demartini Value Determination Process. It's free, it's complimentary, it's private on my website, drdemartini.com. Please take the time to just go and take 30 minutes of your time and fill it out. It'll be eye-opening. You can print it out. You can store it. It's private. You can look at it again, do it again in a week, a month, every quarter, just to see what your values are demonstrating is really priority to you. Because anytime you're setting goals and objectives that are congruent and aligned with what you value most, you increase the probability of achievement. And you walk your talk, you wake up your leadership, you grow your self-worth, you expand your horizons, you tend to do what you say. You're not limping your life. And so finding out what you really value and what your life is demonstrating it as important, that's the first thing. So the first step is determining what you really value and not let the outer influences distract you from what that is. All along my journey in my 20s, I, um, I started speaking sometimes at conferences. I was 23, 24 when I, no, pardon me, 28 when I first did my larger conference. And uh, there are thousands of people there. And I noticed there were other speakers there and I was sometimes enamored with them and putting them up on pedestals and kind of comparing myself to them. And I remember having this lunch with this one of the speakers. And I said, you know, I feel a little bit uh, like an imposter here uh, because some of you guys have done something more than I've done. And, uh, you know, I haven't achieved that, but I'm working towards that. And he looked at me and he said, 
it's interesting that you're saying that. I was actually intimidated talking to you. And I said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, because you are so articulate and you know how to, sh uh, to share and teach. And I wish I had that skill. And you may think, oh, I wish I had that skill to go and do the clinical, you know, management of a practice. But is that really what you're wanting to do? And I go, no, it's I want to share and teach. He says, well, stick to what it is. And he, the guy gave me the feedback. And I said, I realized that I was sitting there envying somebody else, trying to imitate somebody else and injecting his values and trying to be somebody I wasn't and distracting myself from my confidence of where I was. That's why I tell people the, the magnificence of who you are is far greater than all those injected values and fantasies you might in, inject. So instead of getting distracted by enamoring with my, with my colleagues, I just kept focused and I built momentum. And then I found out that they looked up to me and for my skill, I looked up to them for their skill and we all honored each other's skills and it was such a big relief. So first determine what you value. Go online and do the value determination process. Do it again. You'll probably distort it at first. You'll probably write down what you think it should be, ought to be, supposed to be, got to be, have to be, what you wish it would be, what it used to be, instead of write down what your life demonstrates. You know, if you're watching from a, a, a drone up above, looking down in your life and watching what you actually do and how you spend your time and what you fill your space with and how you're, you're um, you know, what you're inspired by and what you're really disciplined to do every day, what you spontaneously do every day, it will give you a revelation of what it really is important to you. And a lot of times we're afraid to admit it. I'm as certain that a great majority of people are afraid to admit what's true. They want to live in a fantasy and they're not going to do anything except beat themselves up doing it. You're designed to beat yourself up when you're trying to be somebody you're not because it's trying to get you. Your own physiology is trying to get you back to being who you are. So number one is determine what your values are. Go online and take advantage of that. That's why in the breakthrough experience, every time I do the breakthrough experience, um, I make sure that's done because I don't want them wasting time on goals that aren't congruent with that. Don't waste your time on low priority things. Only go after things that are truly deeply meaningful and inspiring to you. So you will walk your talk and achieve things and build momentum. That's number one. Number two, ask yourself, how can I get handsomely or beautifully paid to do that? Whatever that top value is. Mine's teaching. So I asked myself many years ago, I mean, this is very young. How can I get handsomely and beautifully paid to teach? Because if I don't find a way of doing what I love and getting paid for it, I'm going to have a Monday morning blues, a Wednesday hump days, a thank God it's Fridays, and a week friggin' end. And I'm going to be working at doing something I don't love to make money so I can then blow it and spend it on dissociating from that unfulfillment by immediate gratifying consumables and depreciables and never get around to do what I really love to do, except as a hobby. Now, if that's really what you want to do and only as a hobby, then fine. But every day that you go to work that you're not inspired by, your cytokines and your immune system and your autonomic nervous system is going to let you know it with signs and symptoms. And you're going to be less than inspired. You're, not, you're going to have friction and not fuel. You're not going to be getting up in the morning and go, I can't wait to tap dance to work, as Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett's I mean, even though he hasn't been eating the healthiest foods, everything else, but he's in his 90s. Him and, and um, you know, his partner basically been doing a long, Charlie Munger, they've been doing this for a long time. And that's because they love what they do. And that's important to get to do what you're really inspired to do. So ask, how can I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do it? I ask that. How do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to teach? How do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to write? How do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to travel the world? I found a way. I'm doing those things today and I'm getting paid to do those things. But that meant that I had service to do. You're not going to get paid to do it unless you're serving somebody. And you've got two ways of serving somebody. You may want to write these. <clears throat> You'll laugh probably. You either go out and directly go out and serve customers, clients, attendees with some sort of a value by doing it. Or you serve a partner in a marriage. Who will then go out and make the income so you can do what you love and they're taking care of it. If you want to raise beautiful children, then your number one customer may be your spouse. If you're not working in a normal for format and you're basically a stay home mom or whatever, then you're and you love that and that's your mission, then ask, how do I get paid to do that? Well, you take one client called a husband or spouse or wife who's working and you go and dedicate your life to fulfilling the service of that individual enough for them. They want to go and pay for all your, what you, what you want to do. 
that's still a customer. It's still a business. It's just a family business. <laughs> Not the mafia. It's a family business. But but what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're being of service because you're not going to generate an income unless you're serving somebody's needs. And if you're not generating an income doing what you love, you've got a Monday morning blues, Wednesday hump takes, thank God it's Friday's week friggin' in environment. And then you're going to have to escape what you're, that you have the doldrums for to go and escape and make it a vacation kind of thing and escape and blow all your money on doing those things instead of making your money doing what you love and building momentum and valuing yourself. So I ask, whatever I do in business, anytime I'm doing any aspect of my business, I ask, how can I get handsomely paid to do the next step? How can I get handsomely paid to do that? I don't ask, how can I afford to do it or I get in debt? I ask, how do I get paid to do it so I get afford, go move forward? And then I save and invest and I make my money work for me. So it's, I'm doing what I want to do, not because I really have to, but because I love to do it. And there's a freedom in that. So number two is, you know, go and ask yourself, how could you get handsomely beautifully paid to do it? Where you're working and doing what you really love to do. The third one is the highest priority action steps daily. What are the highest priority action steps you can do today that will help you fulfill that dream? And you want to ask yourself, what are the highest priority actions I can do today that can help me fulfill that dream? Help me go and do exactly what I love doing. And if you do that, every single day, you'll get the highest priorities of the highest priorities of the highest priorities, and you'll end up manifesting uh, momentum building achievements towards that objective. So ask yourself that. What is the highest priority action I can do today that can help me fulfill what is most important and what I would love to do and what I want to get paid for? If you ask, what are the highest priority actions I can do today and do that every single day, you'll find a pattern. And if you go and find out what's the highest priority of those priorities, that keep repeating and the highest priority of the highest priorities, the highest priority, the highest priorities, the highest priorities, you'll narrow down what is the, and distill down what is the absolute most important thing to be focusing on. Then once you narrow that down, I found mine is teach, research, write, travel. Teach, research, write, travel. I have delegated the rest. The third one, the fourth one, pardon me, is to make sure that you delegate the lower priority things. And you may be thinking, well, I can't, I can't delegate everything. Well, there is absolutely, if you're going out and generating some income doing what you really love to do, you can afford to delegate lower priority things so you can do more of that to generate more income. The cost of what you, you pay for the delegation will be insignificant compared to what you can generate if you're getting onto high priority things. I learned that when I was 27 years old, 28 years old, and it made a huge difference in my life. And people say, well, that's because you can afford it. You're wealthy. No, I became wealthy and I afforded it because I did it. I want everybody to get that because I did that is I got it wealthy. I just did a podcast the other day and uh, it was the second time I did this lady's podcast. And I guess it was maybe six months or seven months ago we did it again. And she got the idea of delegate. She started implementing it. And she said when we did the second one, she said that was a gold mine. Once I did that, my business had gone up. My income's gone up. I'm actually doing more of what I really love to do and less of the things that I thought I had to do. And I've got people now doing it and it's freeing me up and it's grown my business. And I'm actually freer and more creative and more inspired and less weighed down. I said, that's it. Give people the opportunity to do what they love by you delegating what you don't. And it's, it's freeing. It's amazing. So you want to delegate all lower priority activities to somebody who would have it high on their priority list. Something that they value more than you do, that they would be inspired to do. Get it off your plate. Do what you love, love what you do, delegate the rest away. That is a huge freedom, an action step. And again, my business started at 27. Well, I was teaching before that, but I, I started formerly a clinical practice at that time. And 18 months later, massively grown because I learned to delegate. Because otherwise I was going to bog myself down doing everything that everybody else, uh, you know, that I thought I had to do and I thought I would be better at it. I had all these excuses. You know, by the time I do it, or I, by the time I ask somebody to do it, I could have done it. The way they do it is not as good as me. I could do it better. All these ego trips that we get trapped in that hold us back and uh, the cost of it's not worth it, etc. But if you're not abnegating those things and actually going on to do in higher priority things, it pays. It doesn't cost to delegate properly. Now, you may want to make sure you hire somebody that's inspired to do it and don't hire somebody just to save money. Hire somebody that can get the job done. And that frees you up to do what you really want to do. 
The next thing is to metric your achievements, to actually metric what you're doing. Number five, what are you actually monitoring on a daily basis or weekly basis what you're actually achieving? When I put metrics into my practice, my practice grew. When I put metrics in my, my day, day planning and goal planning and my things, I noticed I achieved more. And what the metrics were is actually documenting, are you doing what you said you did? I put a checklist together, a daily checklist. I call it a did I list. Did I do all the action steps that have proven to achieve my outcome? I put down the strategy. I wrote out the action steps. I put a checklist together. Did I do those every single day? In the morning, I would check it, read it. At the afternoon, I would knock it out and check it off. And then the next morning, I'd look at it again. Anything I was repeatedly not doing, I linked higher to my values or I delegated it to somebody else. And then I freed myself up and refined it and found out if I just make this habit out of this, I'm going to get my achievements. And I metric things to find out what worked, what didn't work, and how do I do it more effectively and efficiently tomorrow. And as I did that, I keep now records. I, if I said that I wanted to go and write books, I, I remember I wrote when I was 21 years old that I wanted to uh, do enough influence in the world to be written about in a thousand books. Where broke the 700 book just recently, just like the other day? 700 books have got some sort of reference to the work. And I'm still working on that. I've got 10 more years I figured I'd have that accomplished. And I said I want to write a certain number of books and in a certain number of languages. And, and I wrote it and I'm metricing it. And I've got those books coming out and I've got the languages that are manifesting. I'm 10 languages away from the goal. And uh, I, I, I write them out. I metric them. It keeps me focused and it allows me to find out what's working and not working and metric it and, and keep records of it. And it's really making you accountable. Are you really serious? You know, if you're having people in a company and you metric their results, they tend to get more done. And you can do the same for yourself. And what I mean by that is a, a KPI, they used to call them, you know, key performance indicator. Uh, or, or some sort of stat on what you're actually accomplishing. I love doing it. I have a whole uh, master planning for life book that I do. And I teach people in Breakthrough how to start that in the Breakthrough experience, how to begin that so you can start to organize and make, take command of your life. If you don't take command of your life, everybody else is going to promote their stuff onto you and expect you to live in their values. And you're not going to be as fulfilled doing that. So I basically go through there. I metric what I'm doing. And I am certain that that pays off. And then you refine what you do. And every day you look at what worked or what didn't work and keep refining it. And ask yourself, what else can I delegate? What else can I refine? How can I do it more effectively and efficiently? What's working? What's not working? These are the things you just keep asking yourself. And lo and behold, as you do, you build momentum and you got achievement and you got the facts. And by having the metrics, you get to actually see what you've achieved. And that's incentivizing for yourself and other people uh, who, who know about that. If, a lot of people, I, if, if I go, if my students sometimes look at my book, they go, oh my God, you actually have got all that documented. I said, yeah. They said, that's amazing because now I can see that you're really serious about a goal. I said, I am serious about an objective. Why would you want a goal that you're not serious about? Why would you want to fill your day with something that's not really meaningful and important to you? That doesn't make any sense. So you want to prioritize your life, as I said. So again, I'm going to go through these again. Determine what your hierarchy of values are. Ask specifically, how do you get handsomely paid to do it? What are the highest priority action steps I can do daily? How do I delegate lower priority things to get somebody who would love to do that to free yourself up? And how to metric the achievements that you do to make sure you're on track and to keep refining what you're doing. And the, the, the sixth one on these six steps, the six most powerful life lessons, is to document what you're grateful for. You know, when you got the metrics there and you're getting to see what you're doing, one thing will happen. You'll either find out that months and months and months ago by and you're not doing it, if so, you get feedback to either go and delete the goal, refine the goal, or delegate the goal, uh, because if it's not happening, it must not be important enough to you. Or it may be the time frame you put on it is unrealistic. And anytime you set a too big a goal in too short a time frame, you'll beat yourself up. So why would you want those in place? Either readjust the time, set reasonable time frames on it, or delegate it more, or put a higher value on it by linking whatever the action steps are to whatever is highest on your value to increase the probability of achieving it, or delete it and quit living in a fantasy that's really important to you. I, I have deleted some goals in my, I had some lofty goals when I started out that weren't real, that I wasn't seeing evidence doing in two, three years in. And I finally just realized, is that really important to me or is that something I'd picked up as a whim? And I finally deleted a few of them and some of them I refined and some of them I've updated. So I, if I don't see some sort of results based on what I really want, I'm not gonna be grateful. 
and I and I will I want my gratitude to go up because when you're grat you're grateful, it, it kind of window washes the mind and opens the heart and allows love to come out, which then clears the mind and inspires you and then brings enthusiasm and then more certainty and presence in your life. And you have more transcendental awareness and a function. And you're less likely to be amygdala based and volatile and distracted by external circumstances. And you're more focused within. So that's the key and to document and incentivize yourself with gratitude. I have the largest gratitude list of anybody I've ever met on, on the planet. And on the podcast yesterday, the lady said, I told her, I said, I've already got you on the podcast, uh, the gratitude list. And she goes, you do? And I said, I've already typed it in. I said, I'll share it with you. And I pulled it up on Zoom and I showed it to her. And she said, I'm actually in your, your gratitude book. I said, you're in my gratitude book. And I've got you twice because we did that, that um, interview six months or so ago. And she said, that was very nice to, to thank you for that. And I said, well, I'm grateful for what you're doing. You helped me reach another million people today. And every time I get to reach the people that I'm setting out to reach, I mean, why not be thankful? And uh, she goes, good point. I'm thankful to have you on a guest because you, our last time we did it, it was a great received uh, uh, interview. I said, thank you. We were helping each other get our goals. What can we say? That's, the, that's how you want to spend your day, doing something that serves other people. If you look really carefully in the, at the moments you've had the most inspiration, most fulfillment in your life, it's going to be the moments that you did something that made a difference in people's lives that you're grateful for. And so you want, you want to make sure that you have it where these things are in fair exchange with people and have gratitude in life. So if you document what you're grateful for and you are basically, uh, you know, doing the sixth step, as I mentioned, uh, you're, when you're grateful for what you got, you get more to be grateful for. And that's something that's going to be worth something in, in the long run in your momentum building achievements in life. So these are six steps that I know can make a difference. Six action steps or life lessons, if you will, that I've incorporated into my life that are just standard for me. And I just know that they'll make a difference in yours if you put them into play. That's why I teach them in the Breakthrough Experience and I share them in my presentations. In the Breakthrough Experience, I have people go through and actually identify what they're grateful for and write a gratitude uh, thing after they do the Demartini Method. They take something that they've never appreciated and they were resentful to and I show them how to do certain action steps to balance out their perception and go in there and be grateful for it. And the moment they're grateful for it, I have to ask them to write a gratitude letter to the person. So they're basically reviving their brain, re neuroplastically malinating their pathways in their brain. In the process of doing that, you grow your potential in life. And so I think that's a great uh, starting point. On a, you know, Every day you want to review in the morning when you get up the things you were grateful for when you went to bed and document them down on a piece of paper. I have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of those gratitudes on a, a, daily, a daily basis. And, and when I go and read back, it brings tears to my eyes. Why not fill your day with tears of inspiration? Why not? There are moments of gratitude, moments of authenticity, moments of transcendence. That's the reason I teach the Breakthrough Experience, to help people get that lifestyle, to get in a habit of doing it, to help them dissolve all the baggage, to help them get clear about what their values are, to help them prioritize their life, to help them plan out their strategies, and to help them achieve what it is that they want to achieve. I don't know if that's something you want, but that's something I, I definitely wanted, and I just... As I learned what was working and not working, I started sharing it with people. And I found out that when I did, then I started getting letters. In a weekly basis, I could get 20, 30 letters sometimes coming in from people around the world that are just extraordinary letters that brings tears to my eyes reading them, who attended the Breakthrough Experience and learned from these principles and put it in operation. And it's amazing. And the longer they go, the more impactful that becomes. So please take the time to go through these six steps. And consider joining me at the Breakthrough Experience, where I can actually make you do it. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to do it and to put them into operation and make a habit out of it. And clear the baggage that's sitting there weighing you down and the illusions. And start owning the traits, the greats in the Breakthrough Experience, where you're not subordinating to people which distract you. And give yourself permission to go after what's really meaningful according to your values, as I've stated in this presentation today. So that way you can master your mind and master your life. And basically, you have a, a, a gratitude attitude in your life and do something extraordinary with life. If you'd like to join me for doing that, I would like to do what I can to make a difference in your life and share these principles and allow you to learn how to apply them so you've got them for life. So join me at the Breakthrough Experience. I know that if you take these principles that I've outlined today and others that are there, because it's loaded with information for two days, it's 24 hours with me. You've got 30 minutes with me today. But imagine 24 hours of going through the most important principles and practical tools you can to master your life. I look forward to seeing you at the Breakthrough Experience. Thank you for joining me today. 